Hi, I'm Pastor Andrew Ebanks, lead pastor here at the Agape Family Worship Center. Thanks for watching this message and we pray all of God's blessings on your life. Here at the Agape Family Worship Center, our mission is to reach people with God's love and the life-giving message of Jesus. Our hope is that this message will take you into a deeper relationship with God and help you to grow and mature in Christ. We want to encourage you to get plugged into a church and find a pastor to shepherd and care for you. If you're looking for a church home, we'd love to have you come and join us here at Agape. You can look us up on our website, www.agapecayman.ky. Please enjoy the rest of this message, and God bless you. It is good to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen? Now, I thought maybe as we start, we would just do a, a simple multiple um, answer question, all right? So, by a show of hands, how many of you all wish you were in jail today? Hospital bed. Six feet under. Church. 60% of you. That was good. That was good. Well, hopefully, uh, we will get to 100% because I can tell you that one of the reasons that God says do not forsake the fellowship of the assembly of the saints is because I believe that when we're in church and we know he's here, Amen. Where two or more are gathered, there he is in the midst of us. That he does things in our lives that we're not aware of. What I mean by this is Jesus is not sitting in a particular chair gauging or judging the quality of the service. He can't help himself. He's active. And I believe this with all my heart. I have to get to heaven because I can't find it in my Bible. But I believe that when we come together in church, we're going to find out there were things we didn't know that we were sick from yet that were healed before we ever knew we had a symptom because he's the God who heals he loves to heal and I believe that when we come to church when we come together with the focus on him because how many it's all about Jesus one person said it's all about Jesus all right now maybe I need to to reintroduce some things I can preach for about seven hours without breaking a sweat so the more amens, the more preach it preachers, the more you wave white hankies at me, all right? The more you shout me down, the more you shout me down, I could knock off four or five hours, just like that. But if you, if you make this turn into a lecture, I can lecture, all right? And, and you'll, you'll remember maybe four minutes of what I have to say. But if you respond to me and, and let me know that you're paying attention, um, and I know you are, uh, because I could just tell you are a, a, a well-fed house that um, I can have you out of here uh, so you can beat all the Baptists to your local best restaurant by noon. Amen? I got full. Anniversary lady. All right. I like that. That's good. It is wonderful to be in the house with you again. This is a, becoming a second home to us. Um, the first time we ever came uh, to the islands was in 1998. Uh, we were just getting ready to start Revival House, and some friends had given us a timeshare to come down and, and visit the island. We just fell in love with the, the beauty of it. About two years later, the same family said, would you like to come back? Now, in the interim between the spring of 98 when we came, we started our church on September uh, 13, 1998. Well, many of you all know our story that on September 10th, three days before that, our son Cody was diagnosed with acute myelocytic leukemia. He was not given uh, a fraction of a chance to live. Of all the children around the world, 5,000 children will be diagnosed with leukemia, childhood leukemia between one and six years old. 5,000 worldwide out of the millions of children. But only five will be diagnosed with a AML, acute myelocytic leukemia, and the survival rate was about 4%. So here we are three days before our first church service, and he's diagnosed, and we're trying to figure out what we did wrong. Uh, we went back to God. So God, do you want us to start the church? Do you want us to all go back? There, I mean, we had a massive uh, uh, group of people. We had all seven of us ready to start our church. All seven. We had a little clubhouse picked out and everything, and the Lord clearly told us, do both. So we started the church for the first year my wife was unable to uh, be a part because she lived down at texas children's hospital but this young boy that had no chance of living this december will turn 23 years old amen 
God is a miracle working God. And because of that, we started a church and we started in warfare. Uh, churches have nice little mottos. Revival House's motto is we're a sharp stick in the devil's eye. In other words, the Satan cannot handle it when you attack him. Uh, he knows how to attack us, but if you attack him, he does not know what to do. So rather than be a reactive church, we're a proactive church. I will never forget T.D. Jakes. How many of y'all know T.D. Jakes or have heard of him? His father taught him in West Virginia, said if you ever are, are brought into a place where you got to go to a fight, bring a brick. And when the fight starts, bring that brick right down on your opponent's nose and the fight will be over before it starts. All right, that's pro. Don't take a brick home and try it on anybody, your neighbor, all right? I don't want to get run out of, out of the country. But in 2000, when we came back, we uh, came on a Saturday, uh, it was a Saturday to Saturday, and, I, and we were... I told Tavi, I said, you know, I'd, I'd like to go to church. We need to find a church, something like us, a little bit charismaniac, pental crazy. All right. And so we went into the Yellow Pages, and there was Cayman's First This, and there was uh, um, Georgetown uh, Second Baptist, or what, what, what are these? And then we found this, this crazy name, Agape Family Worship Center. That almost sounds like a tongues expression, all right? And so we said, that's what, where we've got to go. So I called the church office on Saturday, and Pastor Al answered the phone. And I asked him where he says, don't worry about how to get here. Tell us where you're at, and we will come get you. And we came on that. It was in May, around Mother's Day. And you all had that amazing mud back then, that Mother's Day banquet right over there. And I have never ate that well before, <laughs> all right? And so for the next two times we came down, I would find out when you were going to do that. So we always came in May just so we could have that, that bank. Come on, tell the truth and stay in church. It's all right, all right? And I mean, it was amazing food. And we just enjoyed ourselves. And, uh, and so we've, uh, we've been a part of, of coming first in vacation. But it's 18 years ago the first time we came here to this church. And it wasn't a ministry opportunity. It was just come to fellowship. And over these 18 years, God has, has just kind of woven us together uh, where I have the privilege of being Elena's Uncle Bruce now, all right? And, and she just blessed my heart when she called that out to me yesterday when I, I saw her. And your family, our family, it, only by the blood of Jesus can we be related and be close. Although none of you have been there except for uh, Pastor Alan and Pastor Kathy, um, you all are a part of a, a, a Revival House's family. Our intercessory prayer team which is vibrant and powerful they are war mongers I mean they they come in you know it's it's you can tell when they're meant for war when the intercessory prayer team gets together and they get ready to fight and they go bring it on you know that type of stuff you know it makes a mess a little bit when they, but that, 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 and and this church has been in our prayers ever since that time and this last couple weeks ago um, Pastor Al and Pastor Kathy came and uh, Pastor Kathy was amazing. You have an amazing pastor, amen? And she ministered to, the, to our women on a Saturday morning, and uh, they're still talking about uh, what a great time that was. And then uh, Pastor Andrew, and I gotta tell you, this, I, I honor him, I admire him. He's, he's, God has placed him here. Listen, God does not give you a pastor that you want. He gives you a pastor after his own heart. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 5, I will give you pastors after my own heart. And when God gives a pastor, you need to respect that because it's not the one you picked. We don't live in churches are not democracies. They're theocracies. You've got the over shepherd and the under shepherd, right? And so he came and it, it was, a, I would have been intimidated. He came on a Thursday night. We've had a, a men's group that we meet every Thursday for 22 years. Before I was uh, uh, called to pastor, I was a men's pastor at a church, and every, th see, men don't function well if the only time they get together and are held accountable is once every four or five months uh, uh, for a brunch. Men need to, ladies, if you agree with me, they need to be touched up on a weekly basis. Okay, ladies, it's your chance, ladies, come on. You know, don't, they need to, they need to grow as men. So for, for 22 years, every Thursday night, we, we meet. Now, what I do is I feed them before we meet. That makes more guys come out. 
What a great idea. You know where I got that from? Napoleon. Napoleon said the way to a, 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 an army and their loyalty is through their stomachs. And I found if you feed men, they'll show up. Then they, they feel bad if they eat and leave, so you know, they stay. But Andrew, uh, Pastor Andrew ministered to our men that night, and it was kind of intimidating. You come in, and here's a, uh, 15, 20 men that are ready. And yet they received him, and they've talked about the, the word that he brought. And, and it was just awesome. And then he came on Sunday morning, and we had a Sunday night, and uh, they're already saying about your pastor, when is he coming back? You have a great man of God here to lead you. Amen. If you have your Bibles, because I know you brought your sword this morning, open up to Isaiah chapter 46. Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you for the power of your word. We ask you right now, Father God, that the word would become seed, the seed would be planted in the plowed ground of our hearts and would produce the fruit that you desire. I ask you, Father, that words that, are, that escape my mouth that are in the flesh would be dried up as dust and blown away, but every word you speak through me would become a word of transformation in our lives today. I ask you now to anoint my tongue to be the pen of a ready writer, that I might write the oracles of God upon the tablets of the hearts of these, your men and women uh, here, those that will listen later uh, or watch later by DVD or CD uh, in Jesus' name. And all those going to heaven said, Amen. no, I'm not going to do it to you. All right. The title of this word is All Things New. Now, there was a confirmation to me. The third song we sung at the bottom, one of the lyrics was, and he makes all things new new so God is already preparing you for this word now my job as a preacher uh, let me give you a definition of preaching preaching is a view with persuasion to a divine truth for its activation in other words the preaching of the word is to motivate you to receive the word and then put it into application unfortunately a lot of preaching is just theory Good for that person, good for this. But the true word that God always wants preached is something you can leave here with that can make a difference in your life. Okay, I got one amen. We just added 30 minutes to the message, all right? You want, fake it till you make it. I mean, just tell me something that uh, just, if you don't believe, you don't want, you want me to leave early, then stand up and shout at me. And say, I'm with you, preacher. Come on. Hey, come on, bring this. Did you do that? I told you I'll knock some stuff off of this thing. But if you sit there and look like, like a, the frozen chosen, church of the first dead, no, we, we're alive in church, amen? Now, you've got your Bible open to Isaiah 46. Let me start here in Revelations chapter 1, verse 8. It says, I am, say I am. You're not, but he is. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come the Almighty. Now, the book of Revelation is not a book of prophecy, although prophecy is in it. The book of Revelation, as it's titled in your Bible, is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Do you know you can learn more about who Jesus is in the book of Revelation than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Because in the book of Revelation, he has 27 different names, and each name has its own definition which gives you a greater understanding of the dimensional power that Jesus operates by. It's amazing to study his names and then see what those names mean. Now, in Revelations 21, verse 6, it says the same thing, the Alpha and the Omega. In 22, 13, it, says, it adds this, he is the beginning and the ending, the first and the last. Now, the last part where it has that there's there if you go into the Greek uh, uh, dictionary you begin to see some things that expand it the word Lord there is the word Yahweh but in this context it means possessor owner and master of the house who was and is and is to come represents his timelessness now you and I are bound prisoner to time not prisoners in, in that we are held back by it, but because of the way God has orchestrated men to live on this planet in the time we have, he gave us a thing called a timeline. You and I measure everything by time. 
How long's the service? How long's the ball guy going to preach today? Uh, how old are you? When did you graduate? How long you been married? How old are your kids? We measure everything by time, and time is our reference point. But God gave time to man, but rest of creation does not operate by time. And because God is eternal, I want you to think about this for a moment. He is right now at your conception with you in this room and with all those folks crying at your funeral. He doesn't exist. In, he, he penetrates time, but time is in him. He is not in time. So he is everywhere at the same moment, who was and is and is to come. Now for you and I, he is, he is, is. He is, I am. He is present tense in this room and in every moment of your life along your timeline. It's very important to where we're going this morning. He is the one who brought all things into existence, Alpha. Everything that exists, exists because of him. There is a realm that is more real than this realm. It's called the spiritual realm. It, this is temporary. It is eternal. And although you and I cannot see it, it is more relevant and purposeful than anything that you and I can see here. If God were ever to peel back the veil, even for a moment, there's a good chance we wouldn't be able to get up for a week. This room, this church, this sanctuary, there are more angelic beings here than there are people. Amen. Amen. See, amen means I agree with you. It's dependable, it's trustworthy, it's reliable. That's what amen means. When you say amen, then what you're doing is says, I agree with that. Now, do you believe there are angelic beings in this room right now? All right. How do we know? Scripture tells us. Scripture tells us that, that we are guarded, we are protected. And, the, and the, the angels that are protecting you right now, they, they're, this isn't their first rodeo. They've been, with the, they've been assigned to people from birth to death since the beginning of men. And this room is filled with them right now. And why is it filled with them? Because they love the preaching of the word. They love God, but they also love you, and they are commissioned by God to protect you. If your angelic protection was removed for a split second, you would cease to exist. Why? Because Satan comes to kill, to steal, and destroy, and he is a relentless foe. 99% of what the enemy throws at you never gets to you because of your angelic entourage. And the only thing that ever gets through to you is what God sees that you'll have victory over that will make you stronger. Something happens, the air conditioning goes out like it did at Pastor Andrew's house. It's just going to make you stronger. Why? Because you're going to sweat that extra stuff off with no air conditioning. <laughs> that you and I only grow through resistance. Listen, if, if, you, if I go to the gym, you go to the gym. Oh, can I tell you this? I know that it's just taking more time. That one of my deacons, um, uh, Deacon Jim, and he's a, he's a great guy, um, uh, a wonderful guy, and he's, he's a gym rat. He is always going, where it's 5 o'clock in the morning, working out and doing all this, and, and he kind of makes a lot of us feel kind of bad. And the G, J-I-M goes to the G-Y-M, okay? So I had this revelation that could take care of the regular things I might have to do but sound more impressive to anybody else. Here's what I mean. When most people get up in the morning, they go to the bathroom. You can give me an amen if you agree. I know some of you hold it for a week at a time. Cool. That was Morse code from heaven. Well, in America, we call it a john. You go to the john. Because the, the, your toilet, that's a French word, was created by a French man named Jean, John Crapper. Before he created it, his name was just normal. And the moment he created it, his name became ugly. Can you walk around and say, hi, I'm John Crapper. This is my son, Crap. No, I, I, you can say there are certain things in church. It's all right. But because of that, people would take his first name and applied it so men go to the John or people go to the John. And in crasser societies, they go to the crapper because that's his name. That's his name. It's all right. 
So I thought, what if I na renamed my bathroom from John, the John, to the gym? <laughs> so now I tell people, first thing I do when I get up in the morning, I go to the gym. <laughs> and now because I'm 60, I go to the gym about 16 times a day. <laughs> now Deacon Jim doesn't like that, all right? Because it makes it look like I'm going to, never mind. Okay, so... <laughs> Now, one thing to remind, God, Jesus did not bring sickness, did not bring crime. He brought everything that is, but he didn't bring death and murder and drugs and disease. We understand that, don't we? Those were brought in by the enemy. So what does it mean when it says he brings all things in? It's in 2 Peter 1 verse 3, seeing that his divine power, say power, seeing that his divine power has granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Now, life is life. From, from, from conception to birth to plant life to animal life, he brings all life. Everything living finds its life in what Jesus brought because all things come from him and every, all things come to him. Amen? Now, the word godliness there is simply a reference to the moral attributes and laws that God has released for mankind to be governed by. If I obey the laws, that's a form of godliness. It doesn't say religiousness. It doesn't say churchiness. It means that every man has an internal governing system. When people that break the laws of God or people that commit crimes, they can never say that they just didn't know killing somebody was bad or stealing something was bad. There's an internal mechanism that all both saved and unsaved have that when we are, obey the moral laws that God establishes, we live in godliness and that brings peace and order and prosperity to life. So he is life and godliness, all the things that pertain to it. Now, in that dictionary, it says omega, he is the one who brings all things to their ending and conclusion. Alpha and Omega, beginning and ending, first and last. Now, the word beginning in the ancient Hebrew was the ground defined as the ground beneath which one can build his life. When Jesus gives you a building, a, 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 an alpha, he gives you a foundation to build on. He does all the ground. How many of you all know you can't build a second story on a vacant lot? Amen. You need a foundation. You need a foundation. The synonym is confidence. That when he gives you a beginning, it gives you a confidence that if God is for it, who can be against it? Amen. First means he's the foremost and the chief. Last, he is the one who brings to termination the present state of affairs, the age in which we live. Now, all I'm doing is laying foundation right now because you're going to get excited in a couple minutes. If we understand this, it'll bring wisdom to your life. Revelations 1 verse 8, I am Alpha. Did not say the Alpha. I am Alpha. I am beginning, present tense. He's the beginning. Now, you and I experience Alphas and Omegas every day, every second. Alpha, Omega. At midnight tonight, we, Sunday the 14th will go through its omega. The 21st of October will begin its alpha. Every second has a beginning and an ending. Every moment, every hour, all day long, we experience the beginnings of things and the ending of things. Sometimes they're longer. Sometimes they're generational. How many of you all agree with me and believe that agape is not supposed to be a 64-year-old church but a 164-year-old church? Amen. That it's not going to end soon. It's supposed to be multi-generational. It's supposed to continue. But how many of you all agree that if it's a 160-year-old church, there's a good chance that everybody at the beginning and near the middle won't be here near the 164. So all of us have a part to play. Each of you, this is your house. You, this is the house that you serve in that brings the beginning to an acceptable alpha in your life so that a next generation can have something that they can enjoy and see the increase in. 
God wants us to understand those things. That's why everything has a beginning and an ending. He is our beginning and ending in every second of our life. Now, this is very important. I ask you to turn to Isaiah 46, and we're going to look at it. Are we doing okay on time this, evening, this morning? Anybody feel like they, they need to take a, a gym break? Okay. Isaiah 46, starting in verse 9. Remember the former things long past. For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me. Important. Verse 10. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things which have not been done, saying my purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Now that word purpose means God's plan and will for your life. He actually knows what he's doing with you. He created you for a purpose, for a destiny. Nobody in this room can fulfill your destiny. Billy Graham would fail if he tried to do what Pastor Andrew has been purposed to do. But Pastor Andrew would fail if he tried to fulfill what Billy Graham did. In other words, as unique as a fingerprint or a snowflake, that each of you has been designed by him to accomplish his will and a purpose that if you have breath in your lungs, how many of y'all are breathing? How many of you are not breathing? Raise your hand. I saw it for just a second there. Did you get it down in time? All right, so it doesn't count against you. There's no mark. Okay, that we're breathing. That means we have purpose. That means your destiny is full. It doesn't matter if you mess things up to the point where nobody wants to believe that you're a Christian. Your purpose remains. Your destiny is in God's hand. From the end, he sees the end from the beginning. In other words, God has already been to the end of your life, and he's come back to walk you through it. Can I blow your mind for just a moment? He has already seen your expression the first time you see the color of Jesus' eyes in heaven. Do you remember that great song, I Can Only Imagine? There's no imagine. He knows what you're going to do. He knows whether you're going to fall on your face, whether you're going to cry, but he has already seen you see Jesus for the first time when you step into heaven. Isn't that extraordinary? Shouldn't that should bring you comfort. He's already seen you there. Amen. Come on, somebody. No matter how bad this life is, he's already seen you stepping in. And... He says, now, if you know that, then why are you so concerned about the things today that a year from now you will have forgotten about? See, every one of you, I went and said, okay, I want you to go back four years, three months, two days, and six hours ago. You had a crisis in your life. You did. It was something. May not have been a big thing. Maybe the long guy didn't show up. I don't know what it was. But it is so been so taken care of that you don't remember it see oftentimes we ask god to do something then we face a new challenge and while we're facing this challenge he's did what we prayed about and we didn't even realize he did it he's always moving always working he's always taking this thing to bring you into that place and sometimes he allows that thing to come to you that that you have to resist you have to rise up on your own faith you have to stand as a man and woman of God and take the faith that God has given you and have the victory over a circumstance or a situation if I go to the gym the what the, the 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 metal plated place all right and I start doing this After a while, my arm starts crying out and said, this is stupid. How are we going to win the world doing this? I'm cramping. I don't understand. This makes no sense to me. But see, my arm isn't in charge of me. I know that by doing this, I will cause my arm, if I do it repetitively enough times over time, it will grow stronger and hopefully a little bigger and it can go longer. Now my arm sees the abuse only. Doesn't understand why we're doing this. It makes no sense. We could be feeding the hungry. We could be building boats. We could be doing, and it doesn't understand, but since I know that for my arm, my legs, my back, that if I work them out, they become stronger. They break down, that's what's the soreness, but they build back calloused and stronger. 
I'm looking at the end from the beginning because I already have a goal of how much I want to lift or how long far I want to run. Does it make sense to anybody? But the muscle doesn't understand. It hates the pain. And sometimes God brings you into places where you hate the pain until you say, okay, if you're God and you know everything, I'm in this thing. You've already given me the way to have victory over it. So what am I supposed to be learning right now? What am I supposed to be acquiring? What is the, how is this going to make me a sweeter, more kinder, more gentler, but stronger Christian? And if we understand that no matter what we go through, he has already seen the end from the beginning, you can be like James said in James 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 2. He said, count it all joy, brethren, as you encounter these various tests and trials, that the testing of your faith produces patience and let patience have its perfect work that you might be perfect, complete, and lacking in nothing. Amen. Count it all joy. I'm mad now. I'm upset I don't want to be joyful. Why would God say count it all joy because somebody just stole your car? Why would God say count it all joy because you just found out you're diagnosed with a terminal disease? Why? Because he said, by you counting it all joy, you're understanding that there's nothing coming against you that you don't have the ability to have the victory over. So when it comes, you should be joyful because God is saying, hey, you've got this thing. You've got the victory here. It's all yours. Go ahead and celebrate now. See, God operates in the prophetic. He wants us to say thank you before he does something. You go to a restaurant, they bring you tea. You say thank you. Very rarely do you say thank you before they bring the tea. They'll think you're crazy. But God says he wants us to thank him in advance for these things. And when counted all joy is given, he is saying, say that because whatever's coming against you, I've already seen you defeat it. Count it all joy, brethren. Come on, somebody. You get this attitude, you get this mindset that tells you that God's not gonna let anything overwhelm or overcome you that you have the victory by your faith through anything and everything the devil can throw at you. You are the conquerors. God said that I make you more than conquerors rather than give the anointing to you to just get through it. I don't want to get through anything. I want to conquer something. I've been designed, you've been designed to overwhelm and destroy the works of the devil. We are overcomers. They'll know we are Christians by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. You can't have a testimony unless you've overcome something. Come on, somebody. Now, I will admit, in the testimony, I will admit this, when you're going through the test, all you've got is the monies. Work with me, somebody. When you're going through the test, what do you, oh, I can't believe this is happening. This is so horrible. This is like this. But then when you overcome it, you have the testimony. You bring it together. Amen. And when you share your testimony, your testimony may not be that big. Maybe it's only the size of a mustard seed. But maybe you sharing your testimony brings victory to somebody else. Says, wow, if she can get through that, I can get through that. Come on, somebody, give him a praise this morning. Hallelujah. Now, Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10 says this. Do not despise the day of small beginnings. Hmm. There's a warning there. See, we have the tendency of misinterpreting our beginnings. And we don't like small beginnings. But you can never have God's sized alpha or omega until you can accept his alpha. And sometimes you don't understand it. The word despise there means to disrespect or hold in contempt. If you despise or disrespect the beginning that God gives you, you will never see his desired ending for you. He wants us to understand that he's planned this thing out. And if we're not careful, he will give us an alpha that appears to be beneath our ability. We would know I've been working too hard in church to be told that I have to do parking lot duty now. Wait, no, 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 I got my degree. What do you mean I have to serve in the nursery? Listen, I've been called to preach. I, I don't want to be an usher. Is anybody listening to me at all? 
See, we, we have this sense, and God says, great, I, I've, I've qualified you, I've prepared you. Always remember, God does no on-the-job training. He qualifies the call before he promotes them. And he never changes. He'll never put you in a place where you have to learn what to do while you're doing it. The problem is we don't pay attention to the training time. All we want to do is get through it. All we want to do is get to graduation day. We, all, we, we don't like this thing. But sometimes he says, you're going to be a great man of God. You're going to be a great woman of God. I'm going to take you around the world. And many are going to be blessed by the power of the word that I speak through you. But right now, I need you to clean the toilets during the work week. That's despicable. Somebody like me? God, you gave me this word that I was going to lead a, an end time revival. And now the only assignment I get is to watch the windows at church. And we hold it in contempt because we've misunderstood that that was the course that God said, if you'll accept the alpha I give you without disregarding or contempt of it, you will see the desired omega, which is far greater than anything you could possibly imagine. The other 60% will come on board in just a moment. He's the alpha and the omega. He begins things and he ends things. Everything in your life starts with an alpha. It has to. How many, and I, I know God will never show it. I'll use my life example. I shudder to think how many times I never saw his omega because I didn't pay attention to the alpha. I never saw what he had in mind for the ending of something that would take me from the next level to the next level. Scripture says we go from grace to grace. We saw that in our worship. Strength to strength, power to power. God is the ever-increasing God. And wherever we learn something here, he promotes us to here. When you come up here, it's a whole new different circumstance, new demons, new things that face you. But God's intent, the word says, all roads, all roads lead up to Jerusalem. So we are ever climbing. And when we climb, sometimes we get to a table mesa where we just rest for a minute and we get to see the blessing of God before we start to climb again. But you'll never climb as high as God wants you until you can put your first step, first step on the mountain. Oh, I don't want to take a step on Look how high it is. This is the first step. And God says, don't disrespect the alpha because it may seem like it's beneath you but if it seems like it's beneath you, that's telling you that you need something broken in your life so whatever I give you, you can be excited about. Yeah. Oh my gosh, can you imagine? He is such a patient, loving God and to put up with you and me, determining what we're worthy of, determine where we should be, what we should be accomplishing right now. And rather than if God says, hey, can you, can you um, come up and, and, and pass out an offering? I'll go, yes, Lord. Oh, I'm going so great. You gave me something to do. Hey, would you mind mopping the floor? Oh, I would love to mop the floor of your house, Lord, because if I'm mopping the floor, you're there with me, Lord. We should be excited every time God gives us just the opportunity to do something so inconsequential it doesn't matter at all. But because God said it, it becomes a revelation to you. How many of you are as excited today about God as you were the day you got saved? I would hope. But can I tell you that, that there's a lot of churches full of wet wood. Oh, they were excited when they got born again. They were excited because they'd never heard worship music before. They were excited because there was safe and prosperity in the house. There was safe. It was a sanctuary they could come in. Everything was new. And then people happened. I have a plaque on my study in my office that says, if it wasn't for people, ministry wouldn't be so messy. <laughs> think about that for a moment but listen the marriage existed in the garden before ministry came in ministry came in after the fall when marriage was there it was perfect but people will distract you from the things that God wants you to do and what will happen is the devil will get you comparing yourself to somebody else and they'll be operating your gift, their gift and you'll say I could do that better than they can you are no good where you're not and rather than try to do what somebody else does, ask God what he wants you to do. And then when he brings you an alpha, don't despise it. Accept it. Now let me give you a perfect example. Thank you. Let me give you a perfect example of what I'm talking about. You don't need to turn there, but I'm just going to read out of uh, 1 Samuel 17. 
How many like stories about King David? Verse 32 says this, And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail on account of him. Who's him? Goliath. Your servant will go out and fight with this Philistine. Then Saul said to David, You are not able to go out against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, while he has been a warrior from his youth. So here's David, and he doesn't look like the right guy. He doesn't sound like, well, he sounds like the right guy, but he sounds like he's full of hot air. I'll just go whoop this Philistine. Don't worry about it. But see, Saul's a warrior. Saul has trained men. Saul's been around, and he has heard and known of Goliath, who has been a mercenary warrior since his youth. Goliath has been fighting battles for decades. And so Saul says to David, out of his carnal reasoning, you're too young to be the senior pastor of a church. I don't like the octave you sing, you'll never lead praise and worship. No, 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 you, you, you get air sick. How can you be an evangelist overseas? In other words, common sense will cause other people to diminish your alpha. Now, they may say, I'm worried about you, concerned about you, I don't want you to make a mistake, and maybe their care is based upon maybe your history of chasing rainbows. I don't know. But oftentimes, people will pull you back to where they think you should be. Oh, come on, somebody. Rather than risk going where God tells you to go. David comes in and said, man, I'll put this guy down. And Saul looks at him and said, you're a youth. You're just a little guy. What are you going to do? Why? Saul was looking at the natural and seeing a loss. Because remember what Goliath had said. Send me your best and whoever wins, the other nation will be subjected to him. Saul was not about to risk his nation in the hands of a 17-year-old boy. Has that happened to you? Has somebody said it's not your time yet? Has somebody said you need to study a little harder? Has somebody said get some age, get some experience? Wait till, wait till the silver's on the mountain. And because you respected them and thought that they were looking out for your best, you took a step back rather than asking God, is this the truth in my life? Because not everybody who says they're for you is for you. Not everybody who says they want the best for you want the best for you. That's why in Christendom so oftentimes it's tough to gauge because people say, man, I'm going to be there for you. I'm going to take care of this thing. And you say, okay, and then they never show up again. But listen to what David says. Are you learning something today? Now, in my church, right about now, I would say, I'm almost through. Then the entire congregation will say this together. What does it mean when pastor says he's almost finished? Absolutely nothing. All right? So I'm going to spare you from the misery of looking at your watch. Okay. You all are distracting me. But David said to Saul, now listen to this. What an odd statement to justify his qualification to take on Goliath. Your servant was tending his father's sheep. Well, what's that got to do with a nine-foot monster? When the lion or the bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went out after him and attacked him and rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Since he has taunted the armies of the living God, <clears throat> and David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And David said to Saul, uh, Saul said to David, go and may the Lord be with you. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta realize that God created humor. And we look in the Bible and we get, we get kind of that religious eyes that see everything as life and death and sorrow. There's some funny stuff in your Bible. 
There's some amazing things. You look at the, at the disciples, there was 12 of them, but they acted more like the three stooges than disciples for most of the ministry. I mean, they would come back, and, and he's talking about bread, the living. Did you get the bread? I didn't get the bread. Well, did you get the bread? Yeah, they were always like about a half a moment behind, half a click behind Jesus in the wrestling. And so David says to Saul, hey, listen to me. You know, I'm not big, but I've killed a bear and I've killed a lion when they've gone after the sheep. I don't think Saul gave a hearty endorsement. I think he said, well, Lord be with you then. Take your shot. But listen to this. David, who was in the back 40 with the sheep, with no other body else, nobody to talk to. And can I tell you, herding sheep is not like herding cats. And you just get a visual trying to herd cats. It's not going to work. Sheep don't go anywhere. Sheep just sit there. Now, sheep will tell you they're members of a gang. I'm bad. <laughs> don't mess with me. I'm bad. But that's about the extent of their lives. So what is a 17-year-old shepherd boy with a couple hundred sheep that don't move more than five feet? in a day got to do anybody have a teenage son that you've got to keep him active and occupied or things will start breaking or disappearing in your household come on somebody there's nervous energy there's something that they're, they're start finally getting that testosterone to break free in their life and they just got to be doing something so here's David out there watching the fleet shot the sheep and all the sheep are bad and he hadn't got anything to do, so he just started messing with the sling. Anybody pay attention to what I'm saying? And maybe a thousand times he learned how to send that sling and knock that, I was going to say the beer can off the, off the thing, but they didn't have it back there. Knock, knock the wineskin off, of uh, off of the rock. And he became an expert at 40 and 50 maybe even 80 meters destroying things the type of sling that david had it was about three it was a six foot piece of piece of leather doubled up to three with a small pouch it wasn't like we see in the comics all right they said that when a professional slinger he would get that thing spinning at the rate of an idle of an average car, about four, about 2,000 RPMs in a minute. When they would release the rock, the rock would travel at the pace of a small calibered handgun firing a bullet. And all he did was practice day after day because he didn't have to do much. He didn't say he killed two bears and two lions. All he had to do was practice. He didn't just... Come on. He didn't despise his small beginning. He did what he was told to do. And when he came to the battlefield, he revolutionized warfare because up until that time, warfare was within five feet of your opponent with shield or sword or spear. If you were to throw your spear, you could probably throw it about 10 meters. So everything was hand-to-hand -hand combat. And when David walked out onto that battlefield and taunted Goliath, Goliath said, hey, just come a little bit closer and say that again. And can you imagine David after learning everything in the sheep field? He's got his sling. I'm bad, I'm bad, I'm bad, I'm bad, I'm bad, I'm bad. Come on, somebody. And he's just sitting there, and it looks like he's got an umbrella going out for a walk in the park. And you're going to come after my God with your words, and you say that I'm going to be, our army's going to be eaten by the birds. I got news for you, Bubba. I'm bad. I'm bad. I'm bad. And when he released that stone, if you recall, Goliath despised David's small beginning. You know how we know that? Because he took his helmet off because David was no threat to him. 
And that stone sunk. Basically, they estimate that when that stone, based upon how a sling would be fired by an expert, that stone, the velocity was over 300 miles per hour. When that stone not only hit the skin, it broke the bone and embedded itself in his brain. He was at that moment, have you ever gone back and read it? And it says it killed him. But then it says David took his sword and killed him. It says it killed him twice. The stone rendered him a vegetable. He could no longer process motor operations. He was a vegetable. He was a living man that was dead. And he fell and David took that sword and took off his head. Now here's my question to you. I don't think God ever told David, you're going to be the greatest king of Israel. I'm going to name the throne that my son Jesus sits upon after you because I want you to herd sheep. But if he hadn't herded sheep, he would not have killed Goliath which would not have caused the people to say, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his tens of thousands. That when Saul stepped down and David stepped up, he became that friend of God that revolutionized Israel with the worship of God, the armies of God. They were an awesome thing, but he got his despised beginning, tending sheep. His alpha didn't look anything like his omega. And here's my challenge. I've come all the way across an ocean to tell you. He is making all things new in this house, starting with a det detonation of a declaration. When the Bible talks about declaring or proclaiming things, those can only be done by kings. a declaration, a proclamation. But since you and I are joint heirs with Jesus Christ, we are a race of kings and queens that God has given us by the declaration out of our mouth. In, in, the, in uh, Isaiah 44, it says, Declare ye me the works of my hand. Speak them forth that I might perform them. That things don't happen till you and I say things. We're supposed to release things. We're supposed to proclaim those things. And since the enemy knows that you and I are joint heirs, we are kings and queens with Christ Jesus. And when it says we are joint heirs, it actually means we are equal with him when it comes to honoring from God. He's Jesus. You're not going to be little Jesuses, all right? All right. But he said in the eyes of God, what we speak carries as much weight as what Jesus spoke when he was upon this planet. That's why some of you are not where you should be because God's had to honor your words that have been negative and dead. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. And some of you have used your kingly and queenly right to say, nobody's ever going to love me. Nobody's going to take care of me. Nobody's going to be honest with me. Everybody's going to leave me. I'm never going to make any money. I'll never own my own. Sometimes God just wants to say, hey, Andrew, where am I? Okay. <laughs> He wants us to say, you've been using that tongue that was meant to split mountains and cast them into seas to cause things that do not exist to exist, call things that are not as though they are in your tongue and you've been not using your, your royal right to proclaim and declare. You've been using it to backbite. You've been using it to bring somebody else down. You've been using it because of envy and jealousy. And God says, stop. All things new today. Start using the gift that God has given you to see the kingdom built on Grand Cayman. To see the kingdom of God, a lighthouse to be established on this building where the lost and the sick and the depressed and the discouraged and the possessed can come here because they know it's relief because this is a house that believes that God set it upon this island that the island might know Jesus from one end to the other end. And when this church becomes unified, using your mouths to see Jesus glorified, the kingdom comes. Seek ye first the kingdom of God 
and his righteousness and all these other things shall be added unto you. God says that some of you are going to begin to experience small beginnings that because now you have wisdom you will not despise because you believe in the prophetic utterance that you're going to see the omega that God wants you to have which is more greater than anything you could hope or ask for. You may be a shepherd boy right now or a gas station attendant or a clerk at the bank. And God says, whatever you do with us, do it with a spirit of excellence. You're not working for your boss. You're working for me. You're my light. You're my salt there. And you do the best you can there, even though it may be beneath your ability. But if you give me praise every day and thank me every day, you got a job. And thank me for waking you up and giving you sleep at night. I will break you out of that thing and put you in a place you did not know where the authority that I've given you might be proclaimed. And all would come and say, if God could do it for her, if God could do it for him, surely God is going to do it for me. Somebody ought to shout to God right now. Thanks for watching today's message. We pray that this message has touched your life. The Bible tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus was God's son who came to give us that eternal life. It says that if we confess our sins that he is faithful to forgive us of them. Jesus came so that we could have an amazing relationship with God and our sins could be forgiven. If today you say, I want to live for God and be restored to relationship with him, then pray with me. God, I surrender my life to you today. I repent of my sins and ask you to wash me and clean me. Empower me to live by your Holy Spirit as I follow you. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with me today, then we'd love to connect with you about this relationship that you have with God through Jesus. You can contact us at 345-949-2539 or through our website at www.agapekman.ky as we'd love to connect with you and help you on this new journey. God bless you.